Good morning, and welcome to the Unitarian Church of Edmonton. I'm Lynn Turvey, and I'm your service leader this morning. Joining me are Yvonne Moreau and Gordon Ritchie, our service creator. It's a real joy to be together this morning in person and online. Today is October 31st, Halloween. It is also Samhain. The ancient Celts believed the year was divided into two parts, the lighter half in the summer and the darker half in the winter. Samhain was a division between these halves, the end of the harvest and the time when the veil between our world of the living and the world of the dead was at its thinnest. So today we remember and honor those who have gone before us. An unknown author wrote, Suddenly, all of my ancestors are behind me. Be still, they say. Watch and listen. You are the result of the love of thousands. Let us take a moment to settle ourselves, quiet our electronic devices, as we enjoy a prelude, which was recorded by a few members of our church choir, Coriolis, that just last Thursday. The prelude is, Where Do We Come From?, by Brian Tate, words by Paul Gauguin. Where do we come from? What are we? Where are we going? Where do we come from? What are we? Where are we going? Unitarian Universalist faith is a creedless community dedicated to a free and responsible search for truth and meaning. We embrace a pluralist philosophy, opening our hearts and minds to the diverse ideas, feelings, and expressions of our world community. Whatever your heritage, whatever your faith, whomever you love, you are welcome here today. We share with you this morning the 12th of 12 Indigenous names that have been given to Edmonton's redrawn municipal wards. The names were chosen by a panel of 17 Indigenous women, the Committee of Indigenous Matriarchs, and then approved by Edmonton City Council. The Spomita P ward is in southeast Edmonton. It is a Blackfoot word meaning star person. It refers to the Iron Creek meteorite, or Manitou stone, once located southeast of Edmonton. The 320 pound stone was shared by many tribes and was a place where Blackfoot people would perform ceremonies. In the 1800s, it was taken to Ontario by missionaries, but it is now back and on view at the Royal Alberta Museum. And so we acknowledge and respect the histories, languages, and cultures of First Nations, Métis, Inuit, and all First Peoples of Canada, whose presence continues to enrich our vibrant community. I would like to invite Gerard now to come forward to light our chalice, the symbol of our faith community.
We light this chalice for the web of life which sustains us, for the sacred circle of life in which we have our being, for the earth, the sky above and below, and for our mother earth, and for the mystery. Thank you, Gerard. Good morning, everyone. Our first reading is entitled Remembrance Invocation. It's written by Lynn Cox. Welcome, you who approach this time as a journey toward the horizon, the beginning of the new chapter, seeking all the insights and opportunities the new day offers. Welcome, you who live out your values with passion who have a drive for transforming the world toward gratitude and healing, who are ignited by purpose. Welcome, you who ride the waves of life with serenity, you who show uh, courage in facing the depths of true emotion, you who create and change and flow with time. Welcome, you who are here to seek the center, you who wish to be grounded in community, you who call our attention to the present. Welcome all from every direction with all of your gifts and your limits, with all that the past week and the past year have given you. We find ourselves here on the threshold of a new day. Some would say a new year at a time when the past and the present are stirred together in a cauldron of what we shall become. Today, we remember our beloved dead. Today, we give thanks to the people and the forces that helped us to reach this moment. Together, we gather with the saints and the sinners and souls who have been, are being, and will be this congregation as we open up a new path to the future. The festival of Samhain marked the end of the Celtic year and the beginning of the new one, and as such can be seen as New Year's Eve. With this in mind, I would ask that you rise as you are willing and able and sing together our first hymn, number 350, The Ceaseless Flow of Endless Time, hymn number 350. <laughs> This reading is by Heather Lavorne, What Halloween Means to Pagans. I grew up pagan, and my mother, brother, and I all practice different pagan paths as adults. One thing that has always been a constant is Samhain. It's one of the biggest pagan holidays of the year, and the time that we use to remember and welcome our ancestors who have passed on to visit us. The veil is very thin this time of year, and relatives from all over 
drop in to joyfully say hello and see how their descendants are getting on. We honour them and enjoy the chance to visit with them again. For some people that may sound a little off the wall, but for us, it's just the way things are done. We loved and respected them in life, why shouldn't we in death? I'll admit it can be a little disconcerting when great-grandmother Alice decides to haunt the china cabinet. A lot of it belonged to her in life, but we look forward to Samhain every year. Last Samhain, I held a dumb supper for my ancestors. This is a practice in which you set extra places at the table for Samhain and invite your dead relatives to join you for a meal. Traditionally, this is done in silence, but my family always loved to talk at the dinner table. Warmth and fellowship are what draws them home for us, so we don't hold to the silent rule in our home. We dim the lights, light a few candles, and I always open with one of my favorite Samhain prayers. Hallow's blessing for the ancestors. To those whose feet are stilled and those who laugh with us no more, to you we say, our love was with you here and goes with you now to that place where you rest and take delight. May your feet walk along the coffin paths to that place where all is fresh and green, where lovers, friends, and ancestors wait with open arms to greet you. Go in peace and with our blessings. Or remain a while this eve with us, the living, and life and hearth and love. Be rested amongst your own. This eve, this one night, this Samhain. With countless turns of the wheel, we miss you. Be near us this eve. We pray ever for you. And we will meet again once more when the wheel turns for us. Pray be there to greet us in that place we will walk the coffin paths together and bide a while with kin and hearth until that time be near us, our kinsmen, our guardians, our ancestors, our beloved dead. Last year, my great-grandfather dropped in for a visit, so I even put out a beer for him to enjoy. He wasn't much of a drinker, but he did enjoy the occasional pint on special occasions. He sat with us through dinner and asked me how everything was going for us. He was a wonderfully warm man in life and one of my favorite people, so I told him I was well and chatted a bit about my little nephew who he never got to meet. He thanked me for the beer and vittles and told me he enjoyed the visit. When dinner was over, I made an offering of the beer and thanked my ancestors and spirits. Before I went to bed, I lit a candle for them and let it burn through Samhain night, a light in the window to help them find their way home. Please join in singing hymn number 1001 in your teal hymn books. Please stand as you are willing and able. That's 1001.
morning. So, I'm going to talk about a Salwan ritual. I come from a feminist pagan tradition. And uh, so I've got my altar to the dead out front, and I'll just give you a brief tour, starting from your left. Uh, there's a picture of my last dog, Molly, and behind that, a, a little box of her ashes. She was a particularly special dog. Then um, in the gold frame is a picture of my mother and my, a small picture of my dad in the corner when they were young. And just resting behind them are a few pictures of great grandparents. Next to that, I think there's some more little pictures of great grandparents in there. Uh, in the middle, there's a, a book that is a family genealogy, and it records my father's side from 1172 in Orléans, France, and uh, the people came in about 1670 to Canada as Acadians. And in front of that is a little book about the Acadian two beginnings, because they came here once, then they were exiled, and then they came back. And next to that's a picture of my mentor. I can't see if I've got something in front. Um, Winnie Tom, who taught me women's studies and helped me become the person I am today. Then I've got a book of the Day of the Dead, uh, the Mexican tradition of honoring the dead. Um, I believe it's tomorrow or the next day. Tomorrow. And next to that is a, a book I got when I went to the Truth and Reconciliation hearings, as well as some sweet grass and a small book on the Truth and Reconciliation that Louise just gave me today. So that pretty much composes this altar to the dead. I make one every year. It is the time again. I feel it rising in my body as I always have, a growing anticipation. That time of year when the world begins to hush, just enough for the sounds of the old ones to be heard. It is time to make ready for their visits to gather the photos and mementos and arrange them lovingly in the center of my home. I love this time of year when the veil is thinning between the living and those who have died and the need to make ready for their visit begins. Even before I learned about this Samhain ritual of creating altars and practices to welcome our beloved dead, a tradition common to many cultures as well as pagans, I instinctively created my own versions. When I was 14 and my mother died, I set up a space in our living room with a special cloth and arranged her photo on it, along with a small china dish that was special to her, a poem which lamented her loss, and a small vase of flowers. I kept this little altar up for a year and it seemed to be accepted gratefully by my family members. It gave me great comfort to have mom still reside in this center of our living space, as if a part of her had never left at all. I know now through my personal experiences and professional with therapy that, oh, and what I've learned as a bereavement therapist, that it was a healthy response to a sudden and unwelcome, to the sudden and unwelcome changes of her premature and unexpected death. Staying connected to her while I absorbed the loss, let me recognize that although the form of the relationship had changed, she was still a part of my life and always would be. 
It is this connection to our roots that lies at the heart of the Samhain ritual, just as it is with Mexico's Day of the Dead. It is a time to reflect on where we have come from, what and who has shaped us and given meaning to our lives. I welcome the spirits of both blood and non-blood related ancestors whose lives have contributed to the circumstances of my life. In the past, I was more focused on my own blood relatives and close friends. Then my practice broadened to include people whose mentorship helped to shape me, who had a positive influence on my life. Now I recognize that roots go beyond even that, and it's not even all about me. I can see how situational circumstances affected the choices of my ancestors and of all peoples. The original ancestors of this land upon which we now live also played no small part. Before having had their land stolen, under, stolen from under them along with the loss of their ways of life, the indigenous peoples were often very welcoming and helpful to the first settlers. They often got them through their first winters. So this year, I will also have a place on my altar for those relations, recognizing also that my connection with their descendants is ongoing, both as a treaty relationship and a personal one that is in need of healing and reconciliation. My French ancestors who came to this country around 1670 as Acadians, no doubt relied upon the help and advice from their Aboriginal neighbors, developing cordial relationships and possibly even intermarrying, as some of the other French settlers did. Since this past January, I have been learning to speak French instead of just reading it with a vague comprehension. And through this endeavor, I've also been discovering a stronger connection to my Acadian familial roots. Mine is the very first Anglophone generation since my ancestors arrived from France over 350 years ago. I've always believed that losing our French language separates us from our rich heritage. So this year, it will be a bilingual gathering of spirits. Bienvenue, mon ancêtre. Having felt a strong sense of connection and protectiveness to animals and nature my whole life, I'm pleased that this is recognized by Unitarian principles, the interconnectedness of all beings. One of the things that also attracted me to Wicca is the recognition that all of the aspects and elements of nature are also our relations. Again, reflecting the Aboriginal beliefs that all living things are our relations. Since Wicca is rooted in ancient European indigenous peoples, it is not surprising that common beliefs exist among both peoples. My enlarged view of all my relations and ancestors means that it can get very crowded in my living room on Samhain, October 31st. I've experienced quiet, intimate rituals where I've been comforted and given peace, but I've also actually felt my ancestors filling my house and spilling out into my yard. And I'm not really a party person. If you've ever seen the film Truly Madly Deeply with Alan Rickman and Juliet Stevenson, one of my favorites, it's similar to what happens when the dead man invites all his dead friends over for, the party, for a party, thus facilitating his partner's willingness to finally let go of him. But unlike in the movie, once the visit is over, my spirits readily depart after the ritual. I've been setting up and adding to my altar all week, pictures, mementos, and seasonal items. Candles are lit and directions are called, creating sacred space. Grounding myself, I call out to my ancestors, thanking them for their imprint on my life. Then I prepare to listen, 
to hear what they need me to know, their prayers for me. For ritual is simply prayer, and prayer is simply listening to the collective wisdom of the ages. Thank you. One of the purposes of this church community is to encourage all who gather here to grow more generous in spirit and action. In addition to supporting this community, we also make a monthly commitment to the wider community. One half of the unidentified cash that is received is given to an outside organization. For the month of October, we are sharing our abundance with Child Haven International. Child Haven International was inspired by the ideals and philosophy of Mahatma Gandhi. It is a registered not-for-profit charity that was founded in 1985 by the amazing Fred and Bonnie Cappuccino. Child Haven assists children and women in developing countries who are in need of food, education, health care, shelter and clothing, emotional and moral support. There are offering plates by both exits and I invite you to make an, uh, a donation to Child Haven International once the service has finished. And for those of you online, I encourage you to go to the Child Haven International website to make a donation to this incredible organization. I thank you for your generosity of spirit and action. Through all we do here in this community and the wider world, we are involved in the important spiritual work of creation and compassion. Please join in singing from you I receive. A question for you. What did the following people have in common? P.T. Barnum, Bella Bartok, Dorothy Dix, Edvard Grieg, Christopher Reeve, Pete Seeger. How's that for a collection of names? <laughs> right? Well, they were all Unitarians. Here's some more names for you. Isaac Newton, Ralph Waldo Emerson, Henry David Thoreau, Florence Nightingale, Walt Whitman, Charles Dickens. Now what about Canadians? Margaret Lawrence, one of my all-time favorite artists, Arthur Lismer, the first woman doctor in Canada, Emily Stowe, Brewer, John Molson. Now I have to mention Lotta Hitchmanova and Lois Hole. We can refer to these individuals and many others as our Unitarian ancestors. Their talent and wisdom continue to be celebrated as part of our Canadian and Unitarian heritage. <clears throat> now let's bring it home. Who are some of the ancestors of the Unitarian Church of Edmonton? Today we remember and honor members of our church who contributed so much to the well-being of the community that is the Unitarian Church of Edmonton. Those whose legacy continues to be a source of pride and inspiration. We celebrate ancestors like Stan Calder who led the way for inclusivity for the Canadian Unitarian Church. Helen Reddy, a champion for social justice. Molly Butterworth, now I didn't know this name, this was a new one for me, Body, Monty Butterworth, who was on the very first UCE board and pushed the government 
to give married women the right to teach in Alberta during the Second World War. Up until that time, only single women were allowed to teach in this province. Ken Ferguson, Russ Smith, and Bernie Keeler for their financial prowess. Bonnie Kyle, who spearheaded the creation of the labyrinth on the floor of Keeler Hall. Jim Logan for his passion towards supporting refugee families. Now let's not forget those who shared their talents and creative gifts with us. Helen Smith, who made many contributions to the UCER show. The musical stylings of Morris Simons. In the homes of many UCE members, you will find the artwork of Jean Roth. This list could go on and on because there are so many who have touched our lives and gave so much of their time and energy to this community. Leslie Takahashi writes, they are more than remembered. They are memory itself. For what we love lives on in the way our beloved dead accompany us through our lives. Their words and wisdom, our guide, their humor, our relief, their restless concern for the world, our charge. There are many ways for us to stay connected with those we love who are no longer with us. I've heard many stories about people finding objects that might be construed as signs from departed loved ones. And there are also those who wait in hope for a sign of some kind. This is where Audrey Brooks comes in. You know you're going to get a good story when Audrey's name comes up. Audrey told me of a conversation and an agreement she had made with her mother before she died. Her mother told her that if there was an afterlife, she would give Audrey a sign by making the clock in the kitchen fall off the wall. Well, to date, the clock is still firmly attached to the wall. But it makes me wonder, could it be enough that every time Audrey looks at the clock, she thinks about her mother? Is she not keeping that story and that memory alive? And isn't that the point? My mother loved the autumn season. We would be driving through the city when all of a sudden, my mother would stop talking, usually mid-sentence, and draw our attention to a tree that was ablaze in brilliant gold. After we acknowledged the wonders of Mother Nature, the conversation would continue. But lo and behold, Mother would once again stop talking, again, usually mid-sentence, and pull our focus towards a hedge that was drenched in electric red. I found this autumn to be particularly beautiful. There were many times as I drove through the city that I would notice magnificent colors. And when I did, I would ask myself, was it my mother who drew my attention to a tree ablaze in brilliant gold? Was this momentary observation my mother's way of communicating with me? Or did she simply teach me to appreciate the beauty of nature? Or was it just a beautiful reminder of the love that we shared? I asked these questions to a friend of mine and the answer I received was, Yes, yes, and yes. Elia Kelmern writes, over the years I've heard many stories, stories about dragonflies and rainbows and love songs coming on the radio at just the right moment. 
Maybe it's just coincidence. Maybe we're looking for signs, so we find them. But maybe those we love are nearer to us than we realize. Maybe love is vaster than the limits of our understanding. And so at this time, when the veil between our world of the living and the world of the dead is at its thinnest, let us take some time to remember and honor those ancestors who came before us. After all, without them, we obviously wouldn't be here. We owe them something, some gratitude for their ability to survive, for their strength and courage, their spirit, their passion, their love, but let's not kid ourselves. Although at this moment, we're focusing on some of the positive attributes of a few of our ancestors, we can expect that they had their struggles and challenges, as we all do. We acknowledge that some of our ancestors didn't dare be their true and authentic self for fear of imprisonment, or worse. We know that there were women who did indeed lose their jobs once they became married. I can't imagine what it was like for my great great grandparents who left Germany for Canada with only a suitcase in hand. We remember and honor the ways in which they made our lives better. And as we remember, we walk through names or parks named by those for, that we admire. We posthumously award citations. We write songs and poems. We lay flowers. We light candles all the while giving thanks. So now that they're gone, isn't it our responsibility to make their restless concern for the world our charge. To take up their torch and hold it high, having been inspired by their life's work. And as we remember and honor them, so too should we strive to make this world an even better place for those who will, who will remember us. Keep in mind, my friends, that at some point, we will be the ancestors. How do you want to be remembered? Suddenly, all of my ancestors are behind me. Be still, they say. Watch and listen. You are the result of the love of thousands. May it be so, blessed be. The perceptible and apparent decline in the strength of the sun at this time of year was a source of anxiety for early ancestors, certainly many of mine. The winter fire symbolized their attempt to assist the sun on its journey across the sky. Fire is the earthly counterpart of the sun and is a powerful and appropriate symbol to express the overwhelming sense of the decay of nature as the winter sets in. We as many Unitarian Universalist communities light candles to mark significant moments in our lives. These events may have brought us joy or sorrow or have been a cause for concern or an opportunity to celebrate. For those of you online, I invite you to type in your thoughts using the chat icon now. For those of you here today, I would ask that you line up single file on the side of the sanctuary and light your candles one at a time. Please use the glass of water to extinguish your tapers. Albert Schweitzer wrote, at times 
our own light goes out and is rekindled by the spark of another person. Each one of us has cause to think with deep gratitude of those who have lighted the flame within us. If you would like to light a candle, I invite you forward now.
I would ask Lynn to light one more candle for all of the thoughts that were written by those who were with us online. May we carry the joys and concerns and moments represented in these tiny lights in our hearts. They express very deeply that we are not alone. As we enter into a time of quietness together, I would invite Yvonne to read Samhain Ancestor Meditation by Patty Wigington. Take a big breath and close your eyes if you wish. Continue to breathe deeply. Think about who you are and what you were made of. And know that everything within you is the sum of your ancestors. From thousands of years ago, generations of people have come together over the centuries to create the person you are now. Think about your own strengths as well as your weaknesses. And remember that they came from somewhere. It is a time to honor the ancestors who formed you. Think about all the people you come from, whose genes are part of you. Some were great people, some probably not so much, but the point is they all belong to you. They have all helped shape and create you. Appreciate them for what they were with no expectations or apologies and know that they are watching over you. Let us keep silent together.
Our closing words are by Kathleen McTeague. They are with us still. In the struggles we choose for ourselves, in the ways we move forward in our lives and bring our world forward with us, it is right to remember the names of those who gave us strength in this choice of living. It is right to name the power of hard lives well lived. We share a history with those lives. We belong to the same motion. They too were strengthened by what had gone before. They too were drawn on by the vision of what might come to be. Those who lived before us, who struggled for justice, suffered injustice before us, have not melted into the dust and have not disappeared. They are with us still. The lives they live hold us steady. Their words remind us and call us back to ourselves. Their courage and love evoke our own. We, the living, carry them with us. We are their voices, their hands, and their hearts. We take them with us and with them choose the deeper path of living. Our closing hymn is number 46 in your great hymn books, Now the Day is Over. Of course, we know the day is not over yet, little ways left, but Gordon really likes this hymn. So if, if you, as you were willing and able, please rise. It's hymn number 46. like to invite Gerard Ford to extinguish our chalice. And as he does so, I offer the, these words entitled Four Element Blessing by Eric Williams. May the firmness of the earth be yours. May the flow of the water be yours. May the freedom of the air be yours. May the fierceness of the fire be yours. May all of the gifts of this life, the below and the above, be with you now and remain with you always. May it be so, blessed be. Before we sing our final song, I would like to make a few announcements. First of all, I need to express my heartfelt thanks to Ruth Patrick and Ellen Logan. I had the greatest conversations with these people and learned so much about our history. And not only did we have wonderful conversations, but after that, they started sending me emails with even more information and uh, just 
made me so proud of, of who we are and where we have come from within this community. So thank you to you both. Uh, Lynn, thank you for being our greeter this morning. Our amazing tech team, Andrew, John, Declan, Jeff, and Gloria. Thank you, Karen, on piano. And thank you so much, Yvonne, for not only being part of the service, but for writing. Such a beautiful reflection. <laughs> May God be a little choked, obviously. And I would like to express wonderful, heartfelt thanks as well, making her debut performance as a service leader, Lynn Turvey. Thank you, Lynn. This is a new role, uh, which I'm very excited that some of you uh, have, are, are going to be taking on. So uh, thank you, Lynn, and thank you to our future service leaders. Well, thank you for being here. Thank you, everybody. Um, I just want to, oh, yes. There have been a few people who have asked me about orders of service. We are not having orders of service, printed orders of service here in the sanctuary. There's a few reasons. One is that we are doing our best to reduce the use of paper. We are hoping and continuing to hope to go paperless. And a lot of this has to do with the new AV equipment that we have. So stay tuned for a lot of exciting um, things that are going to be coming up with regards to the new system that we have in the church. Um, also, with regards to the cameras, there may be some th uh, that gather here today that are not maybe comfortable with being on camera, knowing that our services are being recorded and posted. There are some areas in the church where um, you wouldn't be detected. We need to appreciate um, your sensitivity to this. So let us know, and we can certainly help you with that. We want everyone to feel extremely comfortable while they're with us in the mornings. Also, just a little reminder about our collection plates for Channel Haven. We thank you for your uh, contributions. And so, as is our tradition, keeping socially distanced, let us rise and join in singing our final song, Carry the Flame. for being with us this morning. Let us go forth with joy to love and serve the world. Blessed be and happy Samhain.